Welcome back to the channel. It is I, the J-Shot, and it's time once again to review an early UFC event with a heavy dose of sarcasm and just a dash of information and actual analysis. Now, if you thought that one Ultimate Ultimate was enough for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, well, good for you for giving them that much credit. But unfortunately, no, you're way off. Because on December 7th, 1996, just one year after the original, the UFC decided it was time to do it all over again. But who can really blame them with a title that good just sitting there? Who is the world's greatest fighter? This planet's ultimate warrior. Wasn't that pretty obvious back in the 90s? All kidding aside, at least for a moment, they start things off with a pretty cool promo package advising us that we're about to see some of the best of the best return to the octagon. Guys like Ken One Punch Shamrock, Dawn Free Pizza Fry, Tank Don't Call Him a Pit Fighter Abbott, and the instant legend, Owen Two in the Octagon, Chemo. Really bringing out the big guns for this. The Ultimate Fighting Championships Tournament of Champions, Ultimate Ultimate 96. Bruce Beck says they're in the Magic City, which everyone across the globe knows is Birmingham, Alabama, for what he calls a magical night of mix matched martial arts. Can't believe that's not the descriptor that stuck, but interesting to hear something so close, yet so far away, way back when. He then breaks the news that champ Mark Coleman is out due to a virus. Well, we always said he was ahead of his time, and throws to his broadcast partner, Jeff Blotnick, who he coordinated his outfit with. Blotnick runs down the list of fighters, which also includes Brian Johnston, Cal Worsham, Paul Varlins, and Gary Goodrich. Man, they really threw everything at this event, didn't they? Literally all the big names are here, unless we're talking commentators because the dragon is apparently on assignment, JB is still nowhere to be found, Ben Perry is probably booking hair modeling gigs, Kilmeade gearing up for a very respectable career in broadcast journalism, and Superfoot, well, I think we know why he hasn't made another appearance. Oh, now come on. So let's all give a warm welcome to, checks notes, Tony Blauer? Truly sparing no expenses tonight. He says the excitement backstage is quite electric and explains that the UFC is evolving into more than just an event. Now it's its own combat system. As fighters come into the tournament with multiple skills and they need to not make mistakes. He throws it back to back after saying little else and we get a look at the first round matchups. Of course, no event would be complete without the laws of the octagon. No fish hooks allowed. And the quarters and semis are very slightly different from the final. Makes sense. Glad we got that out of the way. Big John is back to referee. Beck indicates he's a Joe Jitsu competitor who's working what he calls his 90th reality combat fight. I don't know about you, but the word reality really paints a different picture for me. Let's get it Watch your back! The first fight he'll officiate tonight sees two of the most well-rounded fighters the UFC's produced to date, Brian Johnston and Ken Shamrock. One's a kickboxer who can grapple, the other's a grappler who can also grapple. He wants the fight to go to the ground, but he also is a very powerful puncher. This narrative continues despite barely ever landing an effective punch in the octagon and winning all of his fights to date via submission. And no, Leininger tapping to strikes doesn't count as knockout power. Sure, he'll kick and punch, but so did my little sister growing up, and I had legit Gracie numbers against her. 300 and 0 is a conservative estimate. Ladies and gentlemen! With Manny Garcia on the mic, that makes five announcers in just over twice that many events. A bit of a revolving door, to say the least. Are you ready? Hey, that's not your line. Let's get it on! And neither is that. Well, guess what? Shamrock shoots and gets the takedown about 30 seconds into the fight and starts teeing off on BJ against the cage. At first, the shots don't really get through, but that changes pretty quick. Shamrock swings for the fences and Big John lets it play out. Even though Johnston eventually stifles Shamrock's offense, the world's most dangerous forearm across his throat is too much to take and he's forced to tap. Next, we've got a rematch of the UFC 8 final. Don Fry, Gary Goodrich. Last time out, Big Daddy looked dominant early in the fight, but a lack of experience due to only ever having wrestled against guys' arms spelled trouble. Now he's got some recent ground skills, so perhaps this will be a different fight, provided he doesn't get knocked out before it starts. 
Shamrock is injured. He will not advance. Well, somebody's out before McCarthy says let's get it on, but it's neither of the fighters, as old One Punch himself is withdrawing yet again. Back inside the octagon, Big Daddy runs to the center and gets a paw to the jaw for it. Fry turns it into a hockey fight, and the two keep trading stiff shots. Makes it easy to see why some fuddy daddy's called the young sport barbaric, as it's just a straight slugfest. Eventually, Goodridge hauls Fry down and exposes his sexy underpants, but as Blotnick indicated pre-fight, Big Daddy doesn't have the greatest ground skills. Fry weathers the storm from the guard, attempts to snag an armbar or two, and finds himself in top position. Once there, Goodridge gives up from exhaustion, and we're halfway through the quarters. To the other side of the bracket now, David T. Abbott and Cal Worsham. The lawless street fighter against the former Marine with a wide range of skills, including jiu-jitsu. Worsham, four years in the Marines, three years in the Army. Abbott, many years on the street. Beck calls Abbott an American pit fighting champion, even though last time out, Tank admitted that term is actual nonsense. The only question mark about Tank Abbott is his stamina. Actually, I do have a few questions. Like, who shaves that really cool upside down pyramid in the back of your head? How many times do you bench press over 600 pounds? Speaking of pounds, you claim to have lost 25 of them. Where did they come off? Your ankles? And who hurt you, Tank? Why are you so angry? As expected, they meet in the middle and start launching bombs at each other. Tank goes for his patented push the opponent against the cage move, but seems to remember how that backfired last time and instead goes full Royal Rumble and looks to toss Worsham over the top. Cal fights back from high above, but soon gets brought back down to earth where Tank throws hard shots and before too long, enough's enough. Worsham taps and then complains that Tank hit him late. He wants him disqualified, but Big John tells him to knock it off. And that's the last we see of old Cal inside the octagon. Big right hand. Okay, time to finish off the first round with the polar bear Paul Varlins and Mr. Leopoldo himself. Jesus's BFF has slimmed down considerably. Whatever he leaves on his plate's evidently been scraped off and dropped in front of Big Paul, though, because he's now in the 340 pound range. The polar bear is 100 and five pounds heavier than chemo. Minimal. Told us 360 in the interview, and certainly looking at him, I can believe that. The commentators are supposed to be putting him over, discussing the incredible amount of damage a stegosaurus like Varlins could do to someone in the octagon, but instead they fat shame him and crack jokes. He is the Rodney Dangerfield of the UFC. For real though, he's so big he makes big John McCarthy look like little John. What? Chemo is a different story. Beck calls him a missionary man on a bare knuckle mission. What? He slimmed down but still looks the part. Tattoos covering his still heavily muscled physique, despite having seriously decreased his steroid intake. A UFC legend! The legendary one tries for a takedown right out of the gate, and it looks like the end is near early on. Varlin's holding him in place and dropping punches and elbows. Chemo tries to pick the big man up onto his shoulder, but he's not a giant wooden cross, so the attempts don't go anywhere. But he never stops working for it, and on a few occasions, he almost gets the big man off his size 18s. Chemo recently has come off three wins in Japan since the summer. The last one was over Bam Bam Bigelow. Yep, back then there were no rules. So you better believe we counted it as a win when you beat the brains out of a professional wrestler who wasn't expecting a real fight. Rest in peace, Bammer. Back to the action, while holding him against the cage, he seems to remember how poorly that strategy worked for Tank last time out, and instead decides to just fall backwards, pull all 300 plus pounds of Paul on top of him, and hope for the best. The really crazy thing is, it works. Not right away though, oh no. He gets slugged and smothered for five straight minutes before the polar bear gasses out. An easy reversal, half a dozen right hands, one flying towel later, and Chemo has earned himself his first win inside the octagon. He's not exactly in great shape heading into the semis, but let's give credit where it's due. He's gone from 275 pounds of roided up cluelessness in the cage to a 235 pound, much more well-rounded fighter. It's the first instance of someone enhancing their performance by no longer taking performance enhancing drugs. Wow. Playing the part of Ken Shamrock in the semis is Steve Nelmark, while Don Fry and Chemo are set to collide. But we did pay Tony Blauer for the entire night and he hasn't really done anything yet, so I don't know, maybe an interview with Big John McCarthy?
You got a hard job in there, and you're uh, sweating as much as the fighters. Let's talk about the Worsham fight for a second. Sure. Okay. The, <laughs> thank you. It's not a long interview, thank God. And we move right into some highlights of Nelmark's fight with the grasshopper Marcus Bossett. It's highly technical and dripping with finesse, as you can see. Nelmark is a big boy, weighing in at a deuce and a half, and Beck reiterates to viewers that anything can happen from here. He did prove himself, however, in battle the way Steve Jenham did. Jenham won UFC 3 as an alternate. Yeah, we know. Ben Perry's <laughs> Nelmark is an imposing figure, even with the Don Manningly sideburns. But Tank doesn't really seem to care. With his trademark slink across the octagon, he lands a stiff shot in the opening seconds that sends Nelmark reeling. Follows it up with an actual body slam, avoids getting choked out, and then launches bomb after bomb until he lands a right hand that folds his opponent in half. Hopefully Nelmark is okay. Yeah, he's not. He literally never fought again. Ever. By this point, a dozen or so events in, it should surprise no one that chemo isn't fit to continue. But Mark Hall's hallways ready to go, so it's the martial art of Mu Ye Do versus straight up ass kicking. Hall's last two fights were against the Fryman, losing in the quarters at UFC 10, and then just three weeks prior to this event, Fry submitted Hall with a choke, rather than repeated blows to the face, as he's been known to do to his opponents. And so, just to keep people guessing, or perhaps more likely to avoid injuring his hands on Mark's face, Fry locks in on a leg and gets the tap in literally 20 seconds. It's a very Anthony Macias, Oleg Taktarov-esque fight, with Big John even alleging in his book that he believed the fix was in. And accounts from Hall himself say he was approached by their manager because they had the same one, and told to take a dive if he knew what was good for him. Hall then sells a leg injury in an Oscar-worthy performance, and the UFC gets what they were hoping for in the finals all along. The Predator versus the Potato. Let's get it on! Big John might want to trademark that line. Just saying. Dawn and the Tank meet in the middle and waste little time. A hard left to the chin knocks Fry on his ass, but by the time Abbott reaches him, he's back on his feet. The crowd loses their collective mind as the two heavy hitters grab each other and trade bomb after bomb. You'd think Fry would want to avoid this type of fight, wading into waters that to date barely anyone has stayed afloat in. But he continues moving forward, keeping Tank from loading up and landing another stiff shot by going the hockey fight route. He gets lucky as Tank, unable to walk and chew gum at the same time, is too busy throwing punches to concentrate on using his feet properly. One bad step backwards and he's on the mat where Fry quickly takes his back and sinks in a perfect rear naked choke, giving Tank no choice but to tap. In an effort to save his bad boy image, he leaves the octagon immediately after Fry's hand is raised because who said anything about respect? These people have honor and they respect each other. Well, who besides Blotnik? Tank's a fantastic fighter. Man's an animal, he really is. Okay, fine, so everyone is respectful except Tank. Do we know that for sure? Maybe we should hear directly from the runner-up. I mean, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. You respect Don Fry? No, I don't respect anybody. Come on, man. No, I don't. You don't respect anybody? Not even you. Well, if Tony never comes back for a full night of two 15-second interviews, we'll know why. So 1996's Ultimate Ultimate has concluded concluded. For the most part, the best of the sport were on hand. Would have been nice to see Coleman, Severn, and perhaps even Gracie but the card was stacked either way, and with the win and an improvement to 10-1 and one in the octagon, Don Fry really cemented himself as one of the toughest fighters on the planet. Sadly, after this event, he'd head to the other side of it to try to find out for sure, and we would never see the Predator inside the octagon again. The Ultimate Ultimate 96 proved to be the Ultimate 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 as the Ultimate Fighting Championship shockingly retired the oh-so-catchy name following the event. And with Fry headed to Japan and Severn to the WWF, fans would be robbed of the opportunity to witness the crowning of an Ultimate Fighting Championship Ultimate 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 Champion. A missed opportunity, to say the least. Okay, that's going to do it for another episode of A History of Caged Violence. Remember, if you want to see more videos like this, let me know by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, and watching this video several more times until the word ultimate loses all meaning. I'm the J-Shot. Thanks for watching, and all the best.